charge. Three controls every day. It controls how many of the six? Four. Four of the six extrinsic eyeballs is good. So, so we know it carries parasympathetic motor. We know that it carries somatic motor. Now, what you don't know, oh wait, one more piece. How does it get to the eyes? Through the superior fissure, which is located <coughs> in the Good, between the lesser and greater wings of the sphenoid. Okay, so we got cranial nerve 3 into the eyes carrying somatic motor stuff. You had already learned it carries <coughs> parasympathetic motor stuff, right? Okay, but you don't know yet what this means. Parasympathetic motor to the eyes. Okay, so I'm going to just add a little bit to this, a little bit to this as we go every time, add a little bit more. The parasympathetic motor stuff in cranial nerve 3 controls the size of your pupil. Now, look at the picture. There's a blue and a red line to the eyes. See that? A blue, somebody said you no. Know. Come on, see the blue and the red line? Okay, so the blue line represents parasympathetic motor. The red line represents sympathetic motor. You know this already. All the structures that receive autonomic inter innervation get both. And normally, one does something, the other one does the others. So if you stimulate with this one, you inhibit with that one and vice versa. Okay? So as we get to the eyes, we'll look at the details of this. But you can see both parasympathetic and sympathetic there. <clears throat> now you're gonna see another picture with some of this stuff on it today. And I just wanna I just want if you will allow me, it doesn't matter if you want, I'm gonna do it anyway. We're just going to add, every time we go through this, we're going to add some more to it. So by the time we get to the autonomic nervous system, you're going to be popping with autonomic um, information. Okay, so this uh, parasympathetic spectrum of the eyes controls the pupil size. And as it turns out, your pupil, let's do it this way. You help me and I'll help you. If it's autonomic motor, what does it go to, generally speaking? Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle. Yeah, and glands. Yes, very good. Okay, so as it turns out, the iris <coughs> controls the pupil size. It's smooth muscle. The parasympathetic information there makes the pupil get smaller, and the sympathetic information there makes the pupil get larger. This is what every eye doctor uses to control your pupil size. They put a drug on there that is going to enhance what the sympathetic stuff does and turn off what the parasympathetic stuff does. What are the chemicals? What are the postganglionic chemicals for the neurotransmitters for postganglionic parasympathetics? What's the neurotransmitter? And what is the neurotransmitter for postganglionic sympathetic? The norepinephrine. That's the only different one, right? Okay, so the drugs are <coughs> acetylcholine blockers and norepinephrine activators. So this is a major role for cranial nerve 3, parasympathetic, and you know how it gets there. It's going to pass through the ciliary ganglia. Today is the day. We're in the skull now. Where's this ganglia? So that's coming. The second one here is cranial nerve 7. Now tell me what you know about this one. Seven is the facial nerve. It comes off of the brain and passes through the internal, internal cusimiatus. And if I'm coming to the face to do somatic motor stuff, I'm coming out the stylomastoid frame. Good. So it carries somatic motor stuff. Okay. Um, what about? Autonomics. You know it carries parasympathetic, right? For what purpose? You can cheat if you want to. It's up there. <laughs> yeah. So if it passes through the terebral palatine ganglia, it goes to the lacrimal gland. Now, did you learn something special about that last time? This is confusing on the picture, right? Because we saw the lacrimal picture, and what nerve was going to the lacrimal gland on the lacrimal picture that goes through the superior fissure? 
5. Kramer 5. Yeah. So I'm going to show you that again as we locate the palatine ganglia. 7 also feeds the submandibular ganglia, and this is the one that feeds two of the three sets. That's in a different place. That's further down here, just inside here, on top of the high glossus muscle there. I'm going to locate it for you, and I'm going to use that as an occasion to teach you the muscle attachments on the bottom of the tongue. So the submandibular ganglia then feeds submandibular sublingual, and then cranial nerve 9 feeds the otic ganglia. We want to locate that one also. That will be the last of the four that we'll locate, and that one goes to the parotid gland. So now you've learned the four ganglia of the parasympathetic nervous system. Ciliary, pterygopalatine, submandibular, and otic. How many cranial nerves are associated with those four ganglia in the head? How many nerves are associated with those four ganglia in the head? Don't get this mixed up, people. Parasympathetic information is in 3, 7, 9, and 10. And there are four ganglia. But seven feeds two of them. You see that? The pterygopalatine and the submandibular are both fed by seven. Where are all the vagal ganglia? This was the model that we used for parasympathetics. Where are all the ganglia for the vagus? At the targets. Exactly. They are out here at the targets. Ganglia here. Ganglia here. Ganglia here. The parasympathetic nervous system uses the vagus as a model. So really, these four don't fit the model perfectly, do they? They don't. Okay. Now, uh, we did seven. Um, did I say everything I wanted to say about seven? I did. Okay, so let's find them now. Here's the first one. These are images out of Gray's Anatomy. Um, and so, what? No, it's a book. No, I'm serious. It's, it's like the gold standard for anatomy books. It's not the new picture. Yeah. I have one. I have a copy of my office if you want to see it. It's a fantastic book. It has incredible detail in it. Um, so, um, a number of things that you recognize over here, we're going to talk about. Um, you know this nerve and this nerve are passing through the superior fissure. You also know what the name of this nerve is, yes? What's the name of this nerve? It has three branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular. This is the trigeminal, and so you can see the maxillary branch passing through here. This one is the, sorry, the ophthalmic branch. This is maxillary. What's the name of this hole? Mandibular. That's the rotundum, and this one passes through the ovale. And what else would be associated with this one? Somatic motor stuff, exactly. Okay, so now we're going to come in here and find, I've got it underlined in red for you, the ciliary ganglia. It's a very simple description. The ciliary ganglia is in the orbit of the eye, <coughs> behind the eye. So it's a very simple explanation. There it is right there. Here's the eye here. There's your inferior oblique. Um, here's the inferior rectus. We did these all last time, superior rectus, and there's the ciliary ganglia right there, behind the eye. Here's the second one. This is the uh, pterygopalatine ganglia. And so you can see it labeled right here. Um, this picture is good. Um, because it helps me bring up other things, but I got to put another one in there today just to sort of really concrete this in your mind as to exactly where this ganglia is. It's a very important one. Now, notice uh, some things over here. Let's just notice some things. Let's don't get crazy, but let's notice some things, shall we? Notice that there are preganglionic fibers coming here from T1. Does that surprise you? If I said preganglionic coming from T1, what division of autonomics am I talking about? Okay, so no surprise there. And you can see there is a ganglia here supplied by these preganglionics. So what's, what's wrong about this line here compared to this one? It should be a little different because it's not myelinated. Good, right. So these are myelinated preganglionic fibers to the superior cervical. These are unmyelinated fibers here. 
running along with a blood vessel. We're not going to cover that. And up here you can see the branches of cranial nerve 7 here. Now, 7, you know, uh, is, is both parasympathetic motor and somatic motor. You think of 7 as supplying the five major branches to the muscles of expression, which you should be thinking. And you should also think of 7 as supplying two of the ganglia, right? The pterygopalatine and the submandibular. So we're tracking 7 in here to the pterygopalatine ganglia. And that traverse, this is a very famous anatomy nerve, the very text I don't even think mentions it, um, called the greater petrosal nerve, which carries preganglionic parasympathetic information. Incidentally, this is also the same nerve, this greater petrosal nerve, the branch of seven, is also carrying sensory information from the tongue. Have you heard that before? Seven from the tongue. You sure have. So seven on the greater petrosal nerve. So again, no surprise, information is going both ways. This is seven sensory stuff, and you have seven motor stuff going this way. And you can see seven. I've got this picture on here to show you. Seven feeding the pterygopalatine ganglia, which I've described here as being posterior to the maxilla on each side of the skull between the pterygoid process and the maxillary tuberosity. Now, um, this... Um, this image here um, is, is not a real skull, it's a cartoon, and it's turned downward this way, so you can't really see where the pterygoid plate fits together with the maxilla. And so I found a picture this morning uh, to show you where this is a little bit better, where the skull is tipped up a little bit. Try this one out right here. So there's the eye right there and the nose and the upper jaw. So this skull is like this, and you're looking this way at the pterygopalatine ganglia location, and it labels here for you, just above the third molar here, the maxillary um, tuberosity and the pterygoid plate. Now, this, these plates, these pterygoid plates, you know there's one medial and one lateral, so, um, and those are attached to the muscles of their same names, right? So I'm just reminding you of things you've heard about these things. And so that ganglia is right in here, very close. So where your third molar is, this I'm trying to help you imagine where it is, where your third molar is, just superior to that, between, as I say here, between the pterygoid process, where the lateral medial pterygoids are attached, and the maxillary tuberosity. So that's just anterior to that plate, the pterygoid plate. Okay, so you know where the ciliary ganglia is behind the eye. You know where the pterygopalatine ganglia is, and now you've seen this twice. Seven is responsible for going to the lacrimal gland, but look at what's joining it. Cranial nerve five, okay? So don't get the impression that these ganglia in the skull have only one kind or one nerve supplying them, one kind of information or one, or one nerve. Sometimes the axons will pass right through the ganglia and not even synapse. In fact, there's one, the seven doesn't synapse in called the geniculum. So that's not important. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you a better impression. We're just digging a little bit deeper here. And you've been introduced now, uh, once again, to sympathetics, the seven and five. And now you've picked up the greater petrosal nerve here as a delivery of parasympathetic motor and a receiver of sensory information for taste. What could you add to this? Taste where? The no, on the anterior third. third of the tongue. Like you could have added that right there. Okay. The, uh, the third one is the submandibular ganglia, and it's located on the hyoglossus muscle near the posterior border of the myohyoid. Now, done lab work now. You've seen this one, the myohyoid, right? It's a bit of a fan-shaped muscle, isn't it? It sits, it sits right in there between this triangular muscle extending this way that we call in the lab the digastric, which has two bellies. And we've seen one of those bellies already <coughs> receiving information from a cranial nerve. 
Okay, so we'll bring that up again today. Just keep coming back to it. Eventually it sticks. Okay, so you don't know where the hyoglossus is yet. Or do you? If I say hyoglossus, you didn't have to find that in the lab, but where is that? Hyoglossus. Hyo refers to hyoid bone. And what is the glossus? Okay, so here it is. So you can see here labeled the hyoglossus muscle, which has its attachments on the inferior and lateral portions of the tongue and the hyoid bone. Now, um, the submandibular ganglia is on this muscle near the posterior border of the mylohyoid. Now, this picture does not show you the mylohyoid. You all see that? But this one does. This one you're going to have to learn in all of its glorious detail. So here's the model highway right here. Now, before we do the new stuff, let's do the old stuff. Huh. The anterior belly, the anterior belly of the digastric muscle is innervated by cranial nerve 5. Which branch? the mandibular branch. That's the same branch that went to the temporalis and the lateral and medial pterygoids. Remember that? And the masseter. Those muscles are all innervated, as is this one, the anterior belly. So you've seen that one time before. And I told you we'd see the posterior belly, and it was not going to be surprising either. The posterior belly of the digastric is fed by cranial nerve 7. What's the name of that nerve? Facial. Okay. Which branch? Give me the five branches. Up top. Temporal. Zygomatic. Buccal. Mandibular. Cervical. Cervical. Which branch goes to the posterior belly? Mandibular. Mandibular. Isn't that useful? Which branch of the trigeminal goes to the digastric? Mandibular. Which branch of the facial goes to the digastric? Good. You see how that's useful? The mandibular branches of these nerves feed the muscles that are attached to the mandible. How handy. That's where they get their name. So the digastric has two bellies, the anterior and posterior belly. Now you've seen them both, from the mandible to the mastoid and the hyoid. Okay, so we, we looked at this one um, before, so I'm reviewing that one, but it's really on here today to talk about the myohyoid. The myohyoid, as you can see here, has, is a bit of a fan-shaped muscle. In your cat, it looks like it runs this way. Yeah? And it kind of does. It has its attachments here to the mandible. That's what the Milo portion of the name is. Just on the inside of the mandible, on either side of the synthesis. So it has attachments to the mandible and to the hyoid. That's its name, Milo <coughs> hyoid, from the mandible to the hyoid bone. And it gets innervated by cranial nerve 5. Now, you see this picture of Milo hyoid, and I can back up to this one now and see hyoglossus. So the hyoglossus, you got it? On the sides of the tongue down to the hyoid, and the mylohyoid, which is under here, down to the hyoid bone. Now, describe it again. The submandibular ganglia is on the hyoglossus muscle near the posterior border of the mylohyoid. So that is a good anatomy. You see it sitting right there um, on the hyoglossus muscle. Now this also gives us a good chance here to talk about the other muscles attached to the tongue. Um, they are all innervated by cranial nerve 12. What is the name of cranial nerve 12? What is it? 12. The hypoglossal. Hypo in anatomy means below. And glossus means the tongue. Here are the muscles innervated by the nerve that goes under the tongue, the hypoglossal. What bone of the skull? We haven't looked at it yet, but we will. 
What bone of the skull has the hypoglossal canal in it? It also has the foramen magnum in it. The occipital bone. Okay, so we're getting way back in the skull here, so we haven't got we haven't got to that point yet. But here it is, cranial nerve 12 to these muscles. And so I expect you to know them. We're going to look at them again on this picture. So the genioglossus attaches near the mandibular symphysis on the bottom of the tongue and the hyoid bone. The genioglossus, mandibular bone near the symphysis. Under the tongue, they're all there. And to the hyoid bone, the genioglossus actually makes its way all the way to the hyoid, as does the hyoglossus, which we just did. And the third one of the big three here for the tongue is the styloglossus. What bone has the styloid process on it? The temporal. The temporal bone, right? Okay, so this styloid process is going to show up several times for us. We're going to use it to stabilize the jaw joint when we look at that. It has a muscle attached to it that goes from the styloid process to the inferior and lateral portions of the tongue. In this anatomy picture, how would you describe the arrangement of the hyoglossus and the styloglossus together? What does that look like to you? The styloglossus and the hyoglossus both have inferior and lateral attachments on the tongue. They share that. How would you describe the fibers of these two muscles? What would that look like if you did this dissection, which you're not required to do in the lab? What would that look like? One's going towards the head and one's going towards the tail. They run together. They run together. That's the point. Yeah. I would have been tempted as an anatomist to name this muscle the stylohyoglossus. See that? They run together. The sternocleidomastoid is one muscle. Why not call this one the stylohyoglossus? They're fused together, fibers are, on the inferior and lateral portions of the tongue. But they didn't ask me. And so you have to learn it this way. The styloglossus, hyoglossus, and genioglossus all innervated by cranial nerve 12. Now, let's pick up a little bit more here. We're not going to do all of these. But pick up a little bit more. I like to introduce it. We'll come back to it. And we'll pick up the details. Now, I've got this coded for you. This is the way I remember it. If it doesn't help you, learn it the way you want to learn it. But I've got it coded with big arrows and small slanted arrows. I remember it this way. Okay? So notice that I've got big arrows here and these slightly smaller slanted arrows here. And by the big arrows, I've coded this ansa cervicalis, which you have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't know what the ansa cervicalis is yet, okay? but you will. It's coming very soon in your lives now. The ansa cervicalis is the plexus of the ventral rami of the first few sections of the spinal cord. So uh, when I say ansa cervicalis, um, you'll know a lot more about that. It's part of the cervical plexus coming up. We're not there yet. This one means segmental branches, these smaller branches that come off the spinal nerves that feed the first few, the first five, um, that come off of the first five spinal nerves. Now, I know you don't know what those things are, but if you hear it one time and I come to it the next time, it'll sound more familiar to you. And you can see that these become, these, these muscles here um, become a bit of a problem in trying to remember all the places, so all the nerves and the, and the way that they're innervated and controlled. And so here, there's good news and there's bad news. Okay? The good news is the attachments of the muscles are not a problem because their names tell you where they attach. <coughs> That's good news. The bad news is the innervation schemes are somewhat complicated. We're going to learn them from the top down because that's the way I think about them. So in my view, we're working our way from the head down into the neck now. And so we're going to work that on the nerves as we do that. So you can see the top ones here, five and seven, those are cranial nerves. And the stylohyoid, of course, um, is going to get seven as well. Uh, the stylohyoid um, is going to get branches of seven 
both mandibular and cer uh, cervical, but we're not going to do that one, the details of that one. But notice what happens when we get to the omohyoid and the sternohyoid and the sternothyroid, we start picking up what we're going to uh, term C1 to C3 <coughs> branches of the anticervicalis. So I introduced just the foundation of this to you before. I told you this. I said, in the cervical and lumbar regions of the spinal cord, it's bigger. And I made an issue out of that controlling your arms and legs. And that's true. Okay. But in these first cervical, uh, the first three cervical branches, we actually find that you can get, here it is, here's the, here's the punch line for the plexus. You can get to a muscle in more than one nerve. That is the beauty of a plexus. And this discussion really begins in the neck. You cannot paralyze a muscle that is fed by the cervical uh, upper thoracic, at least a T1, or any of the lumbar or sacral segments of the spinal cord. You cannot paralyze any of those nerves with damage to a single segment. Most of the time you can't damage them with damage to two and sometimes even three segments. This is arguably a design, it's arguable, it's, it's opinion, right? It's a design fail-safe system for skeletal muscle contraction. There's more than one spinal segment that supplies each muscle. Three of them for these muscles in the neck. Okay, so we'll pick these up in more detail. As we go, this is your first introduction. I have said the words segmental branches and I've said answer cervicalis. And you have seen some of these muscles in the neck. But we're not done with the skull yet, so we have to come back to this. All right. I really wanted to use this picture today to show you the mylohyoid. Because that helps me identify where the submandibular ganglia is for cranial nerve 7. At the posterior border there, on the hyoglossus, that's where it is. Okay, the last one is the otic ganglia. And this one is immediately inferior to the foramen ovale. Now, tell me where the foramen ovale is. <clears throat> Give me context for a for foramen ovale. Give me context for foramen ovale. What bone is it in? The sphenoid bone. Okay. Where is it in uh, in the sphenoid? Is it a lesser wing or greater wing? It's in the greater wing. Where is it in relationship to the foramen uh, to the foramen rotundum? It's lateral and posterior, right? It's behind it, exactly. So we learned these before. Um, so there's your ophthalmic. There's your uh, maxillary. There's your mandibular branch of the trigeminal passing through the foramen ovale. Now, I put a picture in here today. I thought I did. <laughs> So we're going to come back to this a couple times. To remind you of what you just told me. There's the rotundum in the greater wing. There's the ovale, just posterior and lateral to it. And then, do you all know what the name of that one is? The spine. Spinosum. That is the spinosum, yeah. So there's, there's not much that goes through there. One little vessel called the middle meningeal artery. And this one is the foramen lacerum at the junction between sphenoid. So the holes we're going to find here in the sphenoid, as we work our way through it, are optic canal in the lesser wing. What nerve passes through that one? The optic nerve. Which one is that? First. Two. Two. Passes through this one. That's vision. Yeah. And then the rotundum. What goes through there? Okay, thank you. Part of the okay, good. So the maxillary part of the trigeminal, there's the ovale, what goes through there? And give you the part, right? Okay, the spinosum you don't know yet, and the last we don't know yet. Okay. <clears throat> now, inferior to the lesser wing, here is a hole that goes into the eyes called. No, there's the optic canal. Superior the superior oral fissure. Anything important that passes through there? The ocular motor nerve and the optic part of the Okay. Um, so we got the ophthalmic 
portion of the trigeminal and give me some more things that pass through there. If I'm going to move the eyes, right, this is where I have to go through, what nerves will have to go through this hole? Three. The anacronym. The anacronym. The anacronym. Four. Three, four, and six. Exactly. Okay, so let's look at them. Here they are. Um, <clears throat> first on the sphenoid, the optic canal. What is the name of that muscle? Corrugator superculi. Okay. What what is the name of that muscle right there? Lateral, lateral rectus, what's that one? Inferior rectus, what's this one? Inferior oblique. Inferior oblique. What is the name of this medial right here? That is the superior oblique. That's right. That's the, the where it passes through the trochlea to attach to the top of the eye. Okay, so there's the, the optic canal shown here with the optic nerve passing through it for vision. The optic canal also has an artery in it. Um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting um, side note. Again, it's not important, I won't ask you this. But notice how this ophthalmic artery, after it passes through the orbit of the eye here, um, so this is it coming off of the, this is it coming off the circle of Willis right here. So this is actually the anterior cerebral artery, which gets branches. This is a piece of the communicating branch of the circle of Willis. This one's going to supply the brain. You're going to learn that one later. This one right here is actually a branch point of the internal carotid. It passes through here and then comes out of the orbit through the supraorbital foramen and becomes the supraorbital artery. Remember I told you it's the connection? This is how they connect here through the orbit, through the ophthalmic artery. I won't ask you that, but you can see it here, the ophthalmic artery passing through the optic canal. The other hole here is the superior oral fissure. Passing through it are three, four, three, four six, and? Yeah, LR6, six, six, four, three, yeah, so that gets that. And then, you said this, the ophthalmic branch of the, of the trigeminal, supplying the cornea, the skin of the nose, and the forehead sensory information. Okay, so that reminded you of it. Here's the rotunda. You can see, again, this beautiful anatomy piece here. You can see the mandibular branch, the somatic motor fibers in the mandibular branch. Here is the maxillary branch passing through the foramen rotundum, and this is the one for the upper teeth. When you go into the dentist's office, you see V2 and V3. If the dentist has a picture on the wall, and it has a V1 on it, then you think, What's he going to do to my eyes? Right? So V2 and V3 for the, for the teeth. The maxillary branch passing through the rotundum. Here are the branches of the uh, mandibular branch here uh, passing through the frame of the valley to the skin of the lower jaw and the lower teeth and gums. The mandibular branch, y'all, in just a little while, the mandibular branch we're going to see once we're off the skull passes through, what is, the, what is this ball right here? That's the body of the mandible, right? So 